With an ever-changing and ever-growing Mercedes-Benz lineup, sometimes it's kind of hard to keep up. Now, I personally was a bit surprised when I found out the current generation S-Class Coupe is going to be discontinued after the 2021 model year. I suppose it makes sense in a world where the E-Class Coupe has grown in proportions and with an ever-growing demand or market shift towards SUVs and crossovers. But that also means I'm surprised to find out that Mercedes-Benz is not discontinuing the SL for the next generation, despite its fairly low take rate, and despite the fact that this is essentially the antithesis of an SUV or crossover. Well, today we're going to drive this car and find out a bit more. This 2019 AMG SL63 started life at $155,000 and as equipped was over $180,000. Now I'm usually not a huge fan of black on white color schemes, in fact I usually like the complete opposite of that. But with this matte black exterior look and this pretty nice white interior, it kind of works in this roadster form. It's definitely better than the original red paint that this car had. This has been wrapped matte black. I know obviously you can get AMGs with that Dezino matte black paint color, but this was originally a metallic uh, red, glossy red. So I like the matte black better than that for sure. You get heated and cooled seats as well as integrated neck warmers in the headrest. You also get blind spot detection, adaptive cruise control, soft closed doors, all standard. All of the R231 SLs, which started production back in 2011 and have just kind of now ceased production, get an automated hardtop convertible. They all get that. And the nice part of it is by being an automated hardtop, the car really feels like it's a coupe. Uh, you get great sound isolation. You also get a really nice exterior aesthetic, which you don't always get with rag tops or certain weird proportioned, I'm talking to you BMW 4 Series, weird proportioned, uh, hardtop convertible, so you get a nice look in this car. You also get an integrated moonroof. It doesn't really open or anything, but there's this glass that's tinted quite darkly, but gives you a little bit of, I guess it gives you some light. Honestly, all I see is blue. I'm sure you guys on the camera probably just see blue as well or purple, but uh, you get that as part of that hardtop. Obviously, you would never get that in a ragtop. So I was actually wrong about this. Uh, you can press a button and it will indeed change shades. The downside of this Hard top convertible is it weighs even more than a regular convertible or traditional convertible uh, car would. So this is a tip in the scales at a little over 4,000 pounds, which is quite heavy if you ask me for a little two-seater roadster. And you feel that weight. In fact, the 5.5 liter V8 you find in this car itself weighs a nice husky 500 pounds, but it produces 577 horsepower and a mouth-watering 664 pound-feet of torque. It's of course twin turbocharged and no longer naturally aspirated as uh, it used to be in a 6.2 liter form. So this is a 5.5 now and not the four liter twin turbo eight that you find in the new C63s and E63s and so on and so forth. The sprint to 60 takes 3.9 seconds and that's because this car has an incredibly hard time putting the power down, especially off of the line. But let's get this Benz back on the road and find out a little bit more. So this is actually the first proper convertible car I've, I've reviewed on this channel. And uh, I really wanted to bring the top down and enjoy some sunny SoCal weather. But believe it or not, we've been experiencing 20 to 40 mile an hour gusts of wind and bringing the top down would probably come at the expense of audio quality. So I'm gonna keep the top up and play it safe. But this also happens to be the most powerful car I've reviewed on this channel thus far. With 577 horsepower, it just edges the X5M, the F85 previous gen X5M I drove, but it had, I believe, 10 horsepower less at 567. So this is gonna be an exciting drive. There's no doubt about that. I must say right off the bat, uh, I'm currently in comfort mode. I'm gonna switch over to sport, actually sport plus. There's comfort, sport, sport plus, and race. We're gonna be in sport plus right now. I'm gonna let the car do the shifting on its own for the time being. And I just got to say, this definitely reminds me a lot more of, say, the M850i that I reviewed a couple months back than it does any of the 911s I've reviewed on this channel. It has that muscle car nature to it versus having a true sports car character. Now, that's obviously by design, but the price, the power, and that AMG badge might leave some people thinking otherwise. Compared to a 911, the ride is a bit more compliant the car is generally more comfortable and smoother, and it doesn't really uh, command your attention the same way 911 does. That's with the exception of the motor, which of 
course is that big hot rod hand-built AMG motor. The only downside is I kind of was hoping that the exhaust would be a bit more obnoxious. I find it to be, I mean, it sounds great and it has a little snarl to it, but it sounds the same, if not maybe a touch quieter than that M850i, which isn't even a proper M car. And I've heard some E63s and some other AMGs, of course, even C63s sound fantastic. So I guess this, maybe it's by design meant to be a bit quieter than say an AMG GT, but I still expected and hoped for more. Wow, it's a RS, or that's a RS7, that looks fantastic. Uh, I still kind of hope for more from this car, sound wise. Oh, you know what? Time to do a little launch. See how the car puts, yeah. <laughs> this car can really uh, break traction through a couple of gears, but Let's get back to why I think Mercedes-Benz has chosen to continue producing the SL despite what I used to think, and even some others used to think, which was that this was gonna be the last generation of SL. I think the biggest and most prominent reason is the lineage. You have to remember that the SL was first introduced back in 1954 in first the 190 and eventually the 300 SL, the Gullwing. Now that's a classic an iconic car that demands, that commands, I should say, a very high price tag, especially right now. So there is this lineage that this car embodies, and there's no doubt that a lot of why this car exists is because of the infatuation people have had throughout this, you know, the decades with the SL. And in that sense, it is kind of similar to the 911. They both have histories that are deep and rich. The one difference is the 911 still more closely resembles itself from 50 or 60 years ago than this does, but that history helps people want to keep coming back to this car because maybe their father used to have one. Maybe they saw one around when they were a child and they wanted to experience it one day. So all of this benefits the SL when you compare it to some of its more contemporary competition. So there are four entire generations between the Gullwing and this R231 current gen that's now going, you know, now it's on its, <laughs> It's now on its last legs, but of course we've had the SLR McLaren, we've had the SLS AMG, now the AMG GT, but this has long been at the top of the Mercedes-Benz lineup, right alongside the S-Class. It's kind of been the king, if you will, of the family. And sometimes kings must die, but I guess this car will live to see another day, and I'm excited for the next generation. I've heard rumors that it's gonna share a platform with the AMG GT, so that should mean that it'll handle and drive even better and be a little bit more engaging and maybe a slightly bit less muscle car. I still think they're gonna keep that GT car nature cooked in though, because that's part of what separates this car, distinguishes it from the AMG GT, and part of what the appeal of this car is. Now, uh, the SL certainly gives you that roadster feeling. Uh, I feel as though I'm sitting very close to the rear wheels. It's not quite as dramatic as say, maybe a Z4, a BMW Z4 or a Jaguar F-Type where you feel like you're almost sitting on top of the rear wheels, but you definitely feel as though you're sitting further back in the car. Um, looking at the car from the outside will indicate that you are sitting in fact very close to those rear wheels. Furthermore, the biggest issue with this car is that it just doesn't have enough rear wheels for its power. So if I put my foot down, I mean, you light those rear tires up with any sort of, you know, heavy right foot. I know the average or typical uh, person who's looking to buy one of these is probably a little bit on the older side and maybe not an immature driver, but part of why you buy an AMG, part of why you buy a car with a hand-built twin turbo V8 producing almost 600 horsepower is to be able to enjoy that power from time to time. And this car has a hard time putting that power to the ground. Very similar to C-classes and M cars of the generation in which this car initially was released to market. These are actually the exact same wheels that you find on a C63S, 19 inch up front, 20 inch in the rear, 255 rubber in the front, 285 rubber in the rear. So it's the exact same wheel and tire that you would find on a C63, on a, or optional on a C63S, which is just not enough tire probably for that car, let alone for an additional 70 horsepower. And I think an additional 150 pound feet of torque. The seating position is pretty good. I would argue that if you're 
over about 6'1 or 6'2, this car is going to start to feel really cramped. Uh, I'm about 6'2 and it's okay. Like I'm definitely not suffering by any means, but I feel my size when sitting in this car, if that makes any sense. It's not uh, effortless, it doesn't disappear around me. Uh, the good news is the seats are very comfortable. They're definitely not quite as sporty as those performance bucket seats you can get in the AMG GT, but a bit more, again, meant for GT style driving and purposes. Uh, and they leave you probably feeling a bit more, uh, <laughs> your back feeling a bit more comfortable at least while driving and while maybe taking this on a road trip up the coast. That's the dream, right? Top down. The interior feels a bit dated now. Uh, it's very nice. There's a, I mean, leather everywhere, carbon fiber everywhere, but the tech certainly feels a bit dated. Some of the buttons and the center console, again, it just reminds me of the uh, W204 series uh, C-classes versus the current gen. And that's considering that the current gen, the W205s are about to go out of production. So we're talking about almost two generation old Mercedes-Benz tech in here. And that's one of the downsides and probably one of the contributing factors to the lower take rate of this car compared to some of its more modern and potent competition. Speaking of competition, this car primarily competes in my mind with the likes of a Bentley Continental GT, an Aston Martin uh, DB11, maybe a Porsche 911 Turbo, depending on the use case, but really, this has that GT characteristic to it. And those are some of the main cars that come to my mind when I think of this car's competition. The BMW 8 Series is also a slight competitor, but that uh, also feels more like a competitor to the S-Class Coupe that now has been discontinued, or an in-between at least. I do really like here in the interior that you get an IWC clock up um, on the dash. I think all AMGs get an IWC clock, which is cool. It has the uh, Ingenieur's uh, dial, if you guys know what that is, but uh, it's pretty cool. It's a very nice, elegant touch that helps make an AMG feel a bit more special than your typical luxury or German luxury car, at least. Something you do not find, for instance, in a Porsche, although they instead have a sports chrono uh, gauge, which in its own sense is very cool. There's also a, an actual shifter. Now, you can't use it for manual shifting, but you can use it to obviously put your car in into different gears. And that's something you find, I think only in this and the AMG GT still. It's a little bit different looking in the AMG GT, but it's a very, very nice little uh, driving enthusiast touched. I'm, I'm really not a huge fan of the column mountain shifter. I know it's a direction that the entire automotive industry seems to be headed, but for now, this is nice. And you get an AMG insignia engraved or embossed into it, which is very, very cool as well. You also get something in this car that I've never seen before, which is a double door sill. So it kind of looks like someone wearing two pants when you look at it. It's the kind of thing that once you see it, you can't unsee it. Uh, it's definitely funny. Only the outer sill says AMG, which I suppose is good because you wouldn't want to have dual AMG side sills right next to each other, or at least both of them stating AMG. But yeah, it's a weird touch, but a cool touch. But I got to say what still does surprise me a bit is just how small this car is on the inside. I'm sure there are people out there who think that SLs have a rear seat. A small rear seat is probably what most people assume, but no, this has no rear seat, just a little tiny bit of storage behind the, the front seats. Uh, but at least it does have a lot more storage than the smallest of little coupes and uh, roadsters do. There's no time better than the present to jump into a little tall boy test. Look, the C-Class Coupe, the C-Class Sedan, they all impressed me with how many tall boys they could fit. Let's see if this car does the same. So without further ado, here's the tall boy test. <laughs> There's no doubt in my mind that this car is more muscle car than sports car. It's something I've already mentioned, but the way I see it, if you're in a 911, even going slow, the car kind of demands your attention. When you go very fast, it gives you a very reassuring sensation, especially around corners, and the car feels very uh, planted. You can easily drive an SL in a civilized fashion completely mindlessly. 
But if you want to use a heavy right foot, then you better be locked in because this thing is far less composed of the limit. Look, like I said, this thing is an Autobahn missile with a nearly 190 mile per hour top speed. It's meant to take on the open road. That's why it's a muscle car, just like how American muscle cars were built for the wide open and vast roads of America. This was built with a similar ethos for the wide open Autobahns of Germany. Top down driving is cooked into the driving experience of the SL. So it's a shame that I can't indulge in that based on the current windy conditions. But I think I mentioned earlier that some hard top convertibles don't look that great. This is certainly an exception to that. With the top down, it looks sleek and clean and kind of how it's meant to look. But even with the top up, it looks like a normal coupe. Um, the body lines, especially along the side profile of the car, are really, really clean. I like the little subtle hints back towards those gull wings with the double slat design on the hood along as well as the side grill. I don't love that the side grills themselves are entirely fake whereas the ones on the hood look as though they're real. What's interesting is the entire rear trunk lid looks to be made out of carbon fiber. Not that it's really helping because this thing still weighs two tons. So the trunk has a little tray inside of it that needs to be brought down in order for, it's like a shelf that needs to be brought down in order for the roof to be able to operate and take the top down. Luckily, as this is a very high-end luxury car, that process of bringing that tray down is automated. There's a button on the trunk, you press it, it brings the tray down, try to make sure nothing is blocking its way. Once you do that, you can bring the top down. Now the top is also, of course, automated. You may be wondering, is it easy to use? Is it fast? Is it, it's pretty fast. I uh, timed it and I'll put a little uh, clip of it opening right here. But I think that um, the coolest part of it is that the actual controls to open and close the top are hidden here in the center console under this little leather cover. That kind of makes you feel special every time you want to open or close the top. I think this is true of almost any Mercedes-Benz convertible, in fact. But what you don't always get in every convertible is an electric wind deflector that with the press of a button will come up and help protect your beautiful hairdo while you cruise up the coast, hopefully, with your top down. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just incredible that this car offers all these amenities and helps convertible driving feel so, or you know, it, it integrates convertible driving so seamlessly into a car that otherwise feels like a normal coupe and it helps you um, effortlessly experience the beautiful bliss of wind and air and an open top. Let's give it a little race mode uh, pull for you guys. <laughs> this thing, this thing's a riot to drive. I mean, it just spun all the way through first. And if you're asking yourself, so why is Mercedes-Benz going to continue making or producing the SL class with a new generation slated to come out in just about a year's time? It's because they can, and it's because there seems to be a clientele that wants exactly what this car has to offer. A bit of luxury, a bit of sportiness, and a whole lot of class. Now, if you guys enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing. New videos will be coming out every single week. And as always, this is Rio. Peace.